would you like to introduce our guest to this evening? Yes, I would be more than honored to introduce my wonderful friend, Jason Friedman, who grew up in a in the evangelical movement in Texas during the satanic pan panic of the 80s and 90s. At 12, he was told he was a prophet of God, but was also under the attack of demons. He was the subject of multiple exorcisms, attempts to no avail and was ultimately shunned by his church group and entire community, which led him spiraling into intense depression. After going through numerous painful life experiences, Jason discovered the field of psychology and realized it was something he wanted to devote his life to. He's currently in school pursuing a master's of science in psychology. Jason can also be found volunteering for the atheist community of Austin and is appearing as a host on several of their shows. Okay, Jason, hit me with your stuff, man. <laughs> 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 and welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm very, very happy. <laughs> Ellen, I really, uh, I really appreciate you dragging me on here. It's, uh, it's interesting. All, all the volunteer work has been more or less your fault or uh, Kelly's fault over at uh, ACD. He's also an ACA host. <laughs> That's what we do. Um, yeah, I mean, both of y'all, you're like, hey, Jason, you're doing this. I go, oh, yeah, 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 you're doing this. What day? Oh, uh, I didn't know. I hadn't, uh, do I have an option? No, just tell me a day. You want to do it this day? Oh, okay, Helen, I'll do it this day. And, uh, yes. but it's interesting. So I, I kind of stumbled across ACD and the ACA stuff about about four ACA stuff about four years ago, and then ACD about three years ago. I was uh, in the midst of kind of existential crisis. I'd been an atheist for a long time, but was uh, currently dealing with some mental health issues that I knew had to deal with like religious trauma and then some some family uh, upheaval. So I, I stumbled across the ACD, and I didn't I didn't know that about Discord. I didn't know about like gaming platforms. I just you know, I, I just kind of play my guitar and weld and uh, dig holes. But then I, I saw that I'm like, well, there's some people who talk about hard shit. And I'm like, okay. So I started having these conversations I've been needing to have with a lot of people. Um, and, you know, because of that, and because I had already started going back to school to pursue my psychology degree, it just kind of all worked together. Uh, so, you know, every Tuesday, I do the brain matters thing on the ACD. And that's uh, kind of like a atheists anonymous in a sense it's a uh, it's peer-to-peer -peer group counseling to where uh, I and uh, my partner who's all a uh, clinical therapist uh, they do radically open DBT um, it's very very intense and I've been trying to convince them to, uh, to to devote more time but they already do I mean they're they're at work right now you know so but uh, Emily and I we, we like to do a lot of work on the ACD uh, Helen actually did a presentation recently which I was very thankful that she took a little time uh away from me i needed to take a break um and then Anytime, my friend, man <laughs> oh no yeah and then uh, she and john did it john's my co-pilot and john is possibly going to be on nonprofits, uh you know with me and helen and all the other wonderful people yeah 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 no it's, it's, it's one day one day it's going to happen uh so how do i get started i don't know where, where do you want me to start you want me to start from the beginning I, or start, I, like the best way start to start at the is beginning yes yeah, start at the beginning so like <laughs> start okay. like i think that you should talk about like your evangelical upbringing okay, and how you were the prophet man what, uh, what's going yes, on i don't think we've had an actual <laughs> prophet no no you never no. have <laughs> you, you never I, i'm have. not sure if we still have but <laughs> 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 tell us about it <laughs> so so um i'm 41 i'll be 42 this year so that puts me right in the middle of the satanic panic. I mean, it was fucking raging. I remember my mom listening to a Bob Larson radio when people would come in and start <laughs> and doing like these death metal vocals saying they're possessed by demons. And it fucking freaked. I, I, mean, I still get shivers thinking about me at that time listening to that shit. My mom's like, see, it's real. And you're, you're evil for listening to Sepultura and Morbid Angel. I'm so, you know, so. Wow, I just yeah. think of all our music exchanges. <laughs> oh, I know, dude, I know. So let me see. My, so my mom was the main spiritual person in the house. My mother was Southern Baptist turned evangelical. And my dad was Jewish, you know, kind of, you know, as Jewish as a Jewish modern Jewish guy really is. He mainly just worked. So he'd be working out of town for months, year, years at a time. And uh, I was just kind of left with my mom. And my mom had developed a uh, an opiate addiction early on, uh, when I was about two or three, and was already pretty abusive from then on. And, um, you know, got to the point to where she just was really neglecting her health and her mental health. 
But uh, during that time, she got really into like, uh, like demons and Satan and, and that we, our church split off and they started doing the, the, the speaking in tongues thing, the laying on of hands thing. But like right around the tw- time I was like 12, 13, I was like, I don't know about this. I just kind of want to smoke pot and listen to metal, you know? And I was still like kind of scared of that stuff, but I was just more like scared of my mom. But then I'd say right around the time I was 13, we were playing the pass out game with me and a couple of friends. I remember Pantera, Vulgar Display of Power, and White Zombies record had all come out. And uh, we were doing the choke out game. And I remember we were listening, it was White Zombie. We were listening to White Zombie. It was one of the last songs on Lost Exorcisto. And my buddy choked me out. And when I came to, and I had a dream that I was at a concert and everybody turned around and they were demons and they started attacking me. And I, I woke up and everybody was just standing there. It was probably seven, 10 of us just kind of like what turned out. I had a really long seizure and uh, stopped breathing and all that stuff. But then instead of getting help, they just stood there. And, and from then, th- then on, I started having a lot of night terrors and sleep paralysis. Mm-hmm. And I was told by my mom that I was possessed and that, you know, this was just, it was all fucked. So I started going to church with them. And I remember, cause I was young. I was, you know, I was, barely 13. I think I was 12 even. Cause it was 93. Yeah. So I was 12. And, uh, I remember they were doing this, like this kind of feverish church service. If anybody was evangelical, y'all, like really evangelical, y'all remember yeah. there was, I know what the, you're talking about. Okay, so yeah. there was the, the, the one hour service, but we all fucking knew that the moment somebody started yelling in the back and somebody started running, it was going to be going on for four hours. Everybody was about to get real fucking emotional and crying and somebody was going to scream and it was just going to be fucking nuts. So it was during one of those kind of, and it was, it's super hazy. Like I remember like later on, oh, whatever, but it's, it still reminds me of being in concerts and being on drugs and, and just all these different, it's the same type of thing. Well, so, and they use some of those. We've we've talked on other shows too about how even like some of the the music and the special effects, basically, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that they do in the service will basically mm-hmm. produce that same kind of experience that you might have at a concert or something well, like that. Well, you're singing. You have these songs that are in these major keys that are really easy to sing, like A. You know, you have mm-hmm. A major mm-hmm. that and A minor. Those are really they really, and you have these one, two, three, one, and they're really trancy, and then you repeat. Da, 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 da. But it it's all like, like modern pop shit. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's like, what is that like? It's like the pop music that sounds like bluegrass, but has like, mm, 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 mm. Yeah. 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 you know, but it's like really like, and you just, kind of, it's like, it reminds me of like, like bastardized against me. Right. You know? So, um, so that's the way, that's what we were into. And I did the praise and worship stuff. And so you get all these like trancy and everybody gets weird. And I remember, sorry, I remember thinking, I'm like, the pastor needs to not, he needs to keep wearing it. And I'm like, Hey mom, I think I need to go tell the pastor to like, keep wearing it. Like it's a, yeah, whatever you did, you get caught in this thing. So I went and told him and he's like, Oh, that's really poignant because I wear a cross on airplanes and I wear it out. And, uh, and I was thinking maybe I should stop wearing it, but you know, like now God's telling me I should keep wearing it. And for me in that insular environment, after getting my music thrown away constantly and starting to have these fucking crazy dreams that that was a thing looking back down, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, but that it was bad. So we, we had this youth group, but my, I kept having these dreams and, and these nightmares. And I was, and, and plus my home life was bad because the drug use started getting really bad. And mm-hmm. then my father was working like gone all the time. So it was just, it was real bad. My, they, my brother was just adopted. And at the fact, I even knew it like eight, nine years old, you're letting this person get another kid because of some medical complications. My mom had to have her baby parts removed and because of that had to be on hormones, which she refused to take and then was in pain all the time. So the opiates were just, we had closets full of opiates and, um, and other drugs. So that started kind of spiraling downhill. My mental health was going really bad around that time. Cause I stopped sleeping. I started I developed insomnia really bad because I was terrified of going to sleep because of these dreams. I was terrified of sleeping. And I started wow. having, well, I started having, well, you have the different types of hallucinations of sleep hallucinations that are involved mm-hmm. paralysis. Mm-hmm. I was having a lot of hypnagogic and the other one, I always forget it, but it's the ones upon sleeping and upon waking up. So like right before I would fall asleep, um, it would go. And then like everything mm-hmm. I'd get, I'd get all weird, you know? And mm-hmm. I remember having a dream mm-hmm. that I, it, well, yeah, later on, I had a lot of them that were really like visceral and I could hear growling pressure on my chest, which we know now 
is very common for people in high stress environments, uh, mm -hmm. people who have been conditioned and not to mention Alzheimer's and dementia runs in my family. And a lot of times we see that we see in some with my, my dad just recently came down with an amyloid plaque. My aunt died from it. My grandmother died from it. I have insomnia. So, you know, it's one of those things. So the more, you know, the better, right. But I, I digress at that point in the nineties, it was demons, right? Mm -hmm. So I was getting involved in this youth group, but also at the same time, I'd also been involved in underground music. I, my cousin had got me into it when I was 12, when I kind of strayed away a little bit, but this was a time, especially in the nineties, you had like a lot of hardcore punk and metal that was becoming really popular in the music, in the Christian music scene. So you had tooth and nail records, you had solid state records. And then you had other bands that were like bands like neurosis, which were like more just songs about the world, you know? So I was able to justify some stuff, bands like Sepultura, more political bands, but I was always kind of waffling back and forth. So I would go to these shows and I was hanging out in tattoo shops at 15, 16, and I would go to these shows and everybody would just call me Jesus, Jason or whatever, call me a holy roller. So I actually have one of my first tattoos, in the back of my leg says holy roller as a joke, right? It, it's just funny, but I was the Christian guy hanging out with a bunch of atheists, with a bunch of gender non-conforming, with, with, with a bunch of, you know, non-heteronormative people, right? So for me, I, the Christian, I guess the way I justified it was Jesus said, be in the world, not of, of the world. All of his buddies weren't anything like him. So I'm like, well, these are my friends too. And they, they kept me around, but I, I, at a certain point, I started getting a lot of pushback from my youth group and my mental health was going downhill really bad. So I remember calling up, they convinced me to separate all ties with anybody who was non-religious. So I remember calling up my best friend at the time, Kristen Busmonte, and, and she wouldn't mind if I use her name. She's, we talk about it. It's, she's cool, man. And I called her up. I said, I can't be friends with you anymore. And it broke my fucking heart, but it was, it was so fucking stupid. They were telling this, this one youth pastor was telling me I couldn't, that I was in love with this girl, Susanna for years. Oh my God. I pined over her. And, and we finally, she finally started, she was my best friend, but I just loved her, but we weren't allowed to date because we were Christian and there's no point of dating unless we we're going to get married. And I mean, oh, you us, did purity culture too. Well, huh? All of us just wanted to get yeah. laid so bad, and none of us. This did. is just like a, a pile of trauma and bad Dude. shit. And trauma oh, I haven't even gotten into shit. it. No, <laughs> it's this is just the preface. This is, no, this this is the is, preface. Oh, it's it's about to get really good. So, so this whole time, my mom's going downhill. She's going in and out of institutions and stuff. My dad's working further and further and more time. My brother's mysteriously ill now and he's around my mom all the time and staying ill so that whole thing starts going on in my household too so i'm going fucking nuts i'm i'm, sui I'm suicidal constantly uh, i can't sleep at night i'm convinced i'm possessed i'm convinced all these things so i start putting all this time into this religious youth group this fucking piece of shit church called the encourager church in houston F fuck those people so Sorry, but seriously, this is why you're, you're allowed to say it. It's okay. Okay. This, <laughs> you this don't have is to why. apologize. Because these, these are people who are like, we're, we're okay. So there was this one guy named Rodney and he was one of those guys. He wasn't the youth pastor, but he was one of those like mid thirties guys that always hung out in the, if everybody knows evangelical culture, there's the late twenties to mid thirties guys that kind of hover around the youth group and start like kind of. You, they're the leader of us seven. And this is the leader of the three. And Rodney had me and this dude, Greg. And, you know, I, I've been deconstructing a lot of shit. I've been going to trauma therapy. And it's funny because, and then studying all the psychology stuff and, and people are like, well, you're bi, so you're a groomer. I'm like, well, what is a groomer? You know, it's a fucking groomer thing. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Rodney was grooming me. There were a lot of, I mean, he was supposed to be my refuge away from my family. I would go to this grown man's house, you know, or he would be at, alone with us in church. And remember I said about those big crying, praying sessions, who was there the entire time holding me and rubbing my back. They had this whole thing in church where it was like, men are too, uh, and men need to be softer and love each other, which I agree. But what I didn't realize what I wanted was another dude, but they, just like, it's like the whole, the old trope is like, you're gay because some guy, some guy took advantage of you. It's like, no, they took advantage of me because I'm, I'm queer. 
it's a different yes. thing. Yes. Thank so, you for bringing that up. Yes. So that was Correlation is not causation. No, no. And also, was, what's up? And, and also, too, if you're suffering abuse, like you're, you're experiencing grooming as a queer person, it's hard, especially in religious structures, it's like, well, am I queer because someone made me queer? Mm -hmm. Or has this been a part of me? And it's something you have to work out you know, between like, is this my authentic self versus this is something that was done to me, which I think that a lot of us yeah. queer people have gone through, yeah. especially coming from religious structures and, and being abused. Mm -hmm. How do you parse that out and find out who you really are and let go of the shit that happened to you, but also become your authentic self? It's, I don't, I don't know. It's, it takes a lot of work. I'll tell you yeah, that. It does. Because, excuse me. The problem is, is that your preference is, is told to you that it's a possession and not a preference. I mean, I'm a demon of love. I was, I mean, I was just, I, I am a raging ball of, of just testosterone. I love it. I love just getting laid. It's the best thing in the world. I've always been. I'm that not going to argue with you. <laughs> it's the best thing. I love it. It's, it's like it's there. You know what I'm saying? Um, if I was a demon, I would definitely be a queer testosterone demon. Dude, I, 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 yeah, yeah, dude, dude. I would I, be yes, a succubus. Yes, like, for free. Anything. I want to be both. I don't know. I want to be all. So I just just pray, give it to me. You know. So, but the thing was, is that that was demonized for me. So I was always convinced I was disgusting. I was always. I remember in sixth grade, I had a during during a thing. I had a. A very, very, and I remember being in that position. Exactly. I'll remember this moment and probably till I have Alzheimer's and I forget everything that'll still be there is when I realize I'm like, I'm not like all these other guys. Like I have to do something different. And then I kept that kept getting reinforced as I got older and older that I'm like, Oh, people are, people see it. They see it. There's something that's okay. So I need to like become more mask and wear a mask, you know, that whole thing. So during that time, this guy, Rodney really groomed me, this guy, Greg, and this other guy, I forget his name, but it's, I have a lot of blockage from that stuff too. But mm. so I, I, so very recently, the reason I bring that up is, yeah, I've been working through a lot of PTSD involving religion. I, 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 I went and took a battery of examinations and uh, UTMB out here in Texas, they had a thing for people who qualified for PTSD treatment. I got a, a part of a grant thing. So apparently I, uh, yes, come on, come on, you know, CPTSD from a lot of, a lot of different things, which we were, we're learning now you tend to have a proclivity for, so, you know, you don't, don't feel bad for having PTSD, you know, it's just, just kind of how it works out. It's an epigenetic thing. What are we going to do? Right. Just work on it. But I, I, again, I digress. It's, I was laying in bed about uh, two weeks ago and i was just going through all this shit i mean i've been I've been dreaming a lot because i've been doing trauma therapy and taking all these inventories about my thoughts and problematic thinking and like what role and responsibility what can i do now and so i've been dreaming about everything it's been intense and and i'm just sitting there of course just wide awake can't do shit so what do you start doing you start searching weird shit on the internet just to humor yourself after you you're so bored you can't read or watch tv anymore Anybody's dealt with insomnia knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, that, that mother fucking motherfucker, you know, that motherfucker was grooming me and touching me and holding me and literally giving me massages all over my, I mean, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, this and I think about myself now that I've been doing MMA now 16 years and I, I know where he lives now. And I've been, uh, you know, it, you, you fantasize about things. I'm not, mm. but you want. So I, again, I'm sitting there. I'm like, you know what? I wonder if that dude ever got like caught for like doing some shit. All right. You know what? Because where we move, you know, where we just bought a house and we have a neighborhood, we have a, a, a school in the neighborhood and there's rules here in Texas about there can't be anybody who's convicted of any sex crimes within a certain area. But so that's why we always get places next to schools. So I'm always checking to see, cause I've got an 11 year old and I'm hyper vigilant and just like a pit bull. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to check the registry, see if that motherfucker, blah, blah, blah. But of course you're like, I'm never going to, of course, like, yeah, he's not going to find it. Oh, uh, whatever, Jason, you know? So I was just like searching for all these guys I went to church with. I'm like, you know what? I'll bet Rodney, I'll bet that motherfucker. Yeah, I found him. So like mm -hmm. seven years after I left the church or about eight years, he was caught uh, in decent contact with a minor. And, and I just fucking knew it. And, and it did something to me that was really it really fucked with me. I was having a couple of hard days. I was talking to my partner about it. 
talk to my therapist, talk to everybody about it. And I, th- I think I even mentioned it to Helen and on the brain matter stuff too. But um, because yeah, I did. I talked about it on brain matters because mm. what it did was this. I had a place that I thought was a fucking refuge from a very miserable home life. You got to think if you're 15 and trying to hang out in tattoo shops and that's better than downtown Houston, that's better than that home. You got to, you know, it's just one of those things. So I thought I had found somebody who was a good guy, a role model, somebody who really cared about me. And, and right then and there, it was just, I'm like, yeah, I, I thought maybe he was grooming me for Christian, you know, but it's like, whenever you're, when it's, when all of your, anxiety's finally confirmed that you had a right to be anxious about that. Like that person actually was following me home or, you know, it's like that. It's like, or those people were plotting against me. See, Mm -hmm. see, I told you. Well, And then all the time, you know, while that's all going on, like, first of all, you're a child and don't have the life experience to recognize it. But on top of that, those same people that you're describing that are, you know, running a youth group and if they're grooming kids, like, they're teaching purity culture at the same time, which intentionally prevents kids from learning about things like Mm -hmm. sexuality and consent and bodily Mm -hmm. autonomy. And, oh, that just, oh, it's so gross to me that, that those, they know what they're doing and they know that they're preventing you from knowing what they're doing. Yeah. It broke my heart. It really, it was like a re it's like, it's like when people talk about that, like grieving a second time, like after you realize that there is no heaven or afterlife or reincarnation and you're like, holy fuck, I thought I was going to see everybody again. And you're just like, it's like this, it's like, man, I thought I had like, yeah, I was, it was like, yeah, it's Christianity, but at least that guy was really nice. And like, just was like really understanding, you know, and let me do these things. And he was, he was giving me alcohol at a younger age and was doing stuff that I, my dad yeah. needed to do. See the motherfucker, you know? So now I look back 16, you know, whatever, a long time later, a couple of cage fights in. And, you know, I just, I just, you know, I, I don't know what it did is I just want to go talk to him and go tell him, I just want to go to his house and be like, fuck you. I know what you did. Fuck you, you piece of shit. And just leave. You know, I just, it's, I don't know. It's, and I talked to my partner about it and I'm like, I probably shouldn't do that. And, you know, she's like, why, why, why wouldn't you go confront them? I go, well, like, are you going to do anything? I'm like, oh, that guy's not worth going to prison for. It's, I mean, I'm sure I'd be doing the, you know, but it's, I, you know, I want to be around my daughter and around my partner and my lizard and my dogs and, you know, more than I want to cave in his fucking teeth. But at the same time, I feel like I just, I don't know if I need to do that. I'll, I, if I feel like I need to confront him, I'll confront him because he took that, he took that away from me. He took that, like, even though it wasn't the best, at least it was something like, no, he took that away from me. So there was like no safe haven in my youth ever. And I was, I was Mm -hmm. getting targeted across the board and, and it was, it it was just really heartbreaking. And then like I had started, I say about 17, 18, I started playing in this band and it, it was with a bunch of Christian guys, but it wasn't like Christian. It was just, like kind of positive hardcore punk stuff, you know, fast stuff, posy hardcore stuff. And um, mainly just saying about being nice to each other and girls. You know what I mean? It's just kind of what it was, you know? And we, we had our Wednesday meetings because I was at that church fucking constantly. And I was, we met up and we we're supposed to have, I guess, a Wednesday meeting and everybody was there before me. We're talking like 20 people. And and I looked at them, I go, okay, yeah, what's up? I mean, I fucking knew already. But they, they were hating the fact that I was getting tattoos, playing in a band. But I, I mean, like, I policed my thought life. I, I, was, I felt guilty for, for masturbating. And I just, you know, I mean, I was praying and fasting. I was doing all of it. And I was as guilty as all of them. I felt as bad about myself as all of them. I was just trying to enjoy my life something. And I thought what I was doing was positive, right? Trying yeah. to be in the world and that whole doctrine, right? The thing, the doctrine you start creating once you start trying to get out of that shit, the whole like Jerry DeWitt doctrine of like, it kind of just becomes nicer and more inclusive until God loves everybody. Right. But, uh, they had the meeting and they told me that I was no longer part of their thing. And then, but I was still allowed to come to the youth group, but I wasn't allowed to interact or have my same level of involvement um oh so they still wanted to act like they were doing you a favor by still trying to save you yeah Yeah. okay they were were doing me a favor but then the thing is of course but but what this was this was on the precursor (sighs) of two things 
one, we had gone on this quote mission trip to Colorado and we all like went to go stay in this like house. It was just so weird and culty. Because and, people in Colorado have never heard of, of Jesus, our Lord and savior. So yeah, but it was like our youth retreat or I don't know. It was, I don't know. And so when we get there, apparently one of the people there, this lady there has the spirit of discernment and she does exorcisms and she could tell that I had demons in me and in front of everybody, they segmented me off for the whole trip. And every day while people were doing things, I had to go sit in a room while people tried to cast demons out of me. And I just sat there for days and days. I was just like, what the fuck is this? This is, this is fucking terrible. And then after that, then like we had done this play at our high school where they asked me like the play was like one of those things where they play a song to turn around and then they do like this like skit of like people dying and then you have to then they needed somebody to help carry a, a casket out like so I, I had to wear like an all black thing so but then my friends and I had lied and said that we were going to do it we, we've started a band and we were going to play a rock song or something but we totally lied and instead we we, we dressed in corpse paint and had goat skulls and full stacks and wrote and wrote songs about the wolf of the apocalypse. It was really silly. My buddy was wearing a purple cape. I mean, it was, it wasn't. And then I played the national anthem with my teeth. So, I mean, it wasn't meant to be, it was meant to be stupid and a prank and I, it was just crap. But so then afterwards, people told me that they saw demons coming out of my mouth. And I, w I was, I was, I was saying, I was going A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. A -E -I, -O -U and sometimes y. <laughs> I mean, so you, you just, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and then like songs about bunny rabbits. It was really, we were just trying to piss people off and get them to turn us off. That's all it was. And I had like these big rubber spikes on. I mean, it was really ridiculous. And yeah, people were telling me they saw demons coming out of me that I called in the devil. I had to do a public apology for that. And so since I was the possessed guy who just played in the satanic band. You, you sound like every other black metal. No, that's a, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just being, whatever. I'm just like a nice guy, you know, and yeah. uh, it's just silly. It's just like, whatever. And so, and then after that's when all that started happening. So um, I still was like, wanted to be involved in some kind of church stuff. So then of course I gravitated towards this cult in downtown Houston, which I thought was a street ministry. And they were like carrying crosses in downtown Houston, but we would also like feed people who were homeless and we would feed sex workers. And, but I didn't realize it was one of those like feed them and make them pray thing. I was just trying, I was trying to find somewhere to help people. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were, they, it was just the same shit that the, the, the demons and the shaking. And I was always friends with girls and I, I was, I was a virgin for a long time because of purity culture. So I always brought like my female friends there. And they they got convinced I was having sex with all of them when I was still a fucking virgin. I just being a queer dude, I tend, I don't know. I just tend to not like being around straight men most of the time because they're weird, I guess. But you know, no offense to straight dudes, but for me, it was like, I don't know. I'm all, it's always weird around you. Like there's yeah, like, well, you're doing this like thing and I just don't get it, but okay. Oh, I'm going to be weird. But it's just well, and, and that can be threatening too, right? Like yeah. if you know that you're not gonna fit that exact model that mm -hmm. they're all promoting, like oh, yeah. you, you I, know you just, don't fit. Yeah, dude. I, it's it's no, no, no thanks. So yeah. they're always weird about stuff with me. So I started finding out that these that the pastor also had some possible sexual abuse charges that he was running from from overseas. And then this other dude was doing some weird shit. Then these people started selling their possessions and moving in together. And this, it's just, so I just had to stop. I just, I had to stop. So I'd have to say right around time that was like 18, 19. I was, I was 20. No, I was about to be 20. I was 19 and I was living in Dallas at the time. And I was, I was trying the prayer thing. And I just like, wasn't, I was having these terrible dreams and not sleeping and, just, just doing everything the Bible said and doing word studies and doing this on my own, managing my own thought life. I remember I was on my knees and I was sitting there. I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I remember it. Fuck this. It's like, I've done everything. I'm fucking miserable. I can't sleep. Everything the Bible says I'm supposed to do, I do. And I was trying to get involved in this other like punk rock, the bass player from that band, all or descendants or whatever. This guy named Cletus was doing a church up in Dallas that I wanted to check out. Everybody had tattoos and punk rock, blah, blah, blah. You know, you had, you had a good mix, punk rockers, non-racist skinheads, metalheads, just the, the underground activist type people. And um, 
it turned out just to be that guy's like, why are you going to see bands play when you could be home praying? I'm like, fuck this guy too. So, and then as I was sitting there praying, I was like, nothing's happening. This is bullshit. So I finally slept whenever I had that thought. I hadn't slept in like three days. I finally slept mm -hmm. and I woke up in the morning and I'm like, you know what? Fuck all this. I'm done. If, if there's a God or if God cares or any of this stuff, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with these dreams about these demons, but if there's a God, obviously he doesn't either give a fuck or he can find me. So I don't give a fuck anymore. I told my girlfriend I wasn't a Christian. So of course she broke up with me and she was done with that real quick because of course Christ before love. Right. So that sent me into a tailspin. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, should I, should I start going into all the drugs and, and everything? I mean, what, what, what? I Share share what you're comfortable um, about. You don't you don't have to tell us uh, all the details. I'll, I'll tell you anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, just, I just don't know. I just don't know how you know graphic. You can um, share as minimal or as, as much or as little as you want. Like we yeah. we 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 do and, not ban free speech. <laughs> yeah, and I should have mentioned at the beginning that you know we probably should have had a trigger warning that obviously we are yeah. talking about trauma and yeah. abuse and uh, drug use and that kind of thing. So you know, if you have just joined us, that conversation will will be continuing um if you oh, have it's gonna be a lot more fun yeah yeah so, yeah. so, so feel free to to mute for a little bit if you need to step out whatever it's it's fine yeah um can i like i know that we're going to go into that mm -hmm. time but i just want to circle back a little bit because you're mentioning being in the church and mm -hmm. dealing with trauma and you're being told you're a prophet and you're being mm -hmm. told that you have these special powers and then you're also being groomed like mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people have experienced this where you're told you have special powers, you're told that you're mm -hmm. special. And there's a lot of people that have had difficult home lives. So to be told you're special, to be told, you know, there's something miraculous about you must have gave you not, I'm not, I'm just saying, um, I'm not trying to project, mm -hmm. but probably gave you a little bit of sense of like, oh, I'm not a bad person. This is just circumstances and give you a little bit of self-esteem. Um, I like, I'm just, I'm. It, it gave and, me more of a, an unbalanced, you know what it gave me? It, it's like, whenever you do these surveys about performance in the job place, Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's women, it's like cis women and cis men being compared. Right. As men always overvalue and underperform, whereas cis women always undervalue and overperform. Mm -hmm. So what it gave me was that sense of like being special, but like not doing anything for it. So okay. It, that makes, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which of, of course being groomed as a male and of course, man is the household thing and you know i, I don't know and the top and I your just, magical penis makes you special jason that's, it, I mean, that's the magical. rule <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that's no, the I mean, rule if you have a penis it's magical and you're better <laughs> yeah no I, I don't i don't agree with that I, i'm constantly feel like a mental midget around my partner so <laughs> i uh i don't agree with that one bit i've worked with women that would annihilate my, my own daughter makes me feel like an idiot on a constant basis so but yeah it definitely gave me this weird sense of like of being a mind reader, because it's like, I always knew. And I was told that I always knew. And I had this discernment thing. And I just like trusted my intuition. And I was just surrounded by yes, people who just I, it. Yeah, I did it really, really fucked with. And just like my personality and the way I approach people. And I still have to work on like telling people and feeling like my opinion is a lot is the only valid opinion. And I, yeah, a lot of that came from religious conditioning, especially as a male. Yeah. And oh, hundred percent. And, you know, I imagine also that's, that's something that is a pretty good hook to keep you involved. If, if being a part of this group means that you're, you're special, you have these special powers, these fruits of the mm -hmm. spirit, you're, you know, are you going to lose your discernment abilities if you, you know, leave the church? Like mm -hmm. that's, that's a pretty good reason to stick around, I would think. Yeah. But, 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 you know, the one thing though, is that it never made me feel good about myself. I always made, I always felt like a piece of shit and I always felt disgusting. And I had so much self-loathing as a Christian. It was because we had kind of a Calvinist backbone, like you're not worthy and you don't even know, like, good luck, good luck knowing we don't know. You can try and try and 
you know, even those will say, God, I know you, but I didn't know you, you were lukewarm. So I spit you out of my mouth, blah, 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 all that shit. So since I was constantly horny and liked death metal, um, I was convinced and I was told I was possessed and had all those dreams. I, I, I literally had a fear and it sounds so fucking ridiculous right now, but I had to fear I was going to be like an antichrist type person that, I mean, I remember this was so fucking irrational, but I was terrified that I was going to be used as some type of, cause you know, again, with the Calvinism thing and the, the God's going to use you how he wants to, right. It's for the greater good, the greater good. So it, it's, I, I, I had this fear that no matter what I did, because I always had shaky belief and I was always very critical and always drawn towards uh, social issues that were antithetical to Christian uh, uh, ideologies and prerogatives. So I, I, I just felt like I was constantly on the fence. So I would try to overcompensate with fasting and praying and trying to be the best at that and dedication of time. And it just made me a fucking anxious wreck. It really did. I, yeah. I never, yeah. I mean, I'd have to say that. So while I felt like I had special powers, I also felt like a piece of shit mm. and, you know, made sure I, I wasn't worthy of my magic powers. Wow. That yeah. is, that's really uh, insightful how you put that. I think it, it's, uh, yeah, that's really frustrating. I, I grew up in a similar kind of evangelical background. Not, not all of those same things obviously um, happened, but, but you're right. It was always, you know, no matter how exciting the, the running and jumping around in the service was, you know, there was still this, this kind of tickle in the back of your mind of, hey, I, I hope I'm really saved. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 And, and that's terrifying when you're a kid. And, and you know, then, like you said, the nightmares of hell and, and everything, it's, it keeps you hooked. It's, oh, yeah. Oh Mind yeah, and, and and the thing is, like bringing up the purity culture thing, like mm -hmm. any perceived small sexual infraction to you was horrendous, like just a normal thing for a thirteen-year-old boy trying to find some boobs in National Geographic or or just something, you know, With horn. <laughs> something, some, something, something <laughs> naked to look at, you know, and you just feel terrible, you know, you just feel mm -hmm. terrible about yourself all the time. And you start doing these weird self, very self harmy very suicidal. I mean, I was suicidal while a Christian. It's like the craziest thing is that whenever my belief dissipated, my fear of death, because I was so terrified of death and hell, my fear mm -hmm. of death and hell, like I don't, I, I'd have to say like my fear of death, like I, f I fear very specific fantasy deaths of like, I'm terrified of dying before my daughter's a certain age. And blah, blah, blah. those are like related to my kid. But without the kid, without my partner, without anything in life, death is just like, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> oops. Fuck, I, we're, we're kind of fucked. OK, it's going to I remember I remember a girl I dated one time. She's she had a joke. It was like, oh, don't worry, you'll die one day. It's OK. Everything will be over. <laughs> you know, it's like, OK, thanks. But it's but it made sense to me, you know, and it's I guess like a positive nihilist in that way. And the same with like fear of hell, like, OK, like there's nothing. Well, OK, that's good. Now, like, I don't have to worry about it. I guess the whole Mark Twain thing, right? I didn't care before. I'm not going to care after. Yeah, that. Yeah. Well, and also like that conversation. Like, I like. I don't think people appreciate how traumatizing the idea of hell is. Yeah. Um, that oh, for any yeah. minor distraction, if you murder somebody or you tell a lie, you're going to burn. You know, be tortured for eternity. Like, there's there's no gray area. You know, and mm -hmm. we still get people that might have they've been out of religion for years but they contact us because that fear of hell it's still a part of their psychology even though they know it's not real the, the trauma is still there because your brain doesn't know between rational mm -hmm. and emotional it's just like i'm scared this is bad yeah. you know and and that's where your brain goes mm -hmm. no, i agree i agree and then you have to mm -hmm. parse through like is this something that i need to dedicate more energy to be terrified of or right a lot, and then a lot of times whenever you're traumatized you get that freeze thing where you're not really fighting or flighting you know you're you're freezing you just kind of lock up it's like uh in cases of uh sexual abuse people are like why didn't they do anything they must it's like no they they froze they didn't they they couldn't their body said if i sit really still maybe it'll be better yeah, and I don't I, think people like on uh, kind of expanding on that is that if someone is willing to harm you in that way, you have no idea what mm -hmm. else they might do. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. you, you, you freeze, you might go along with it because if you don't, like it is a terror they this person could really harm you or kill you because if they're willing to violate you in that way mm -hmm. there is no telling what this person will do because obviously they do not respect body autonomy and boundaries yeah, no, so, I, so after that it's like that's why people don't fight back because we don't know how this per especially children mm -hmm. like you just don't know how this per you know how this person is going to behave if they're violating you as a person and your boundaries well i mean yeah you, you mentioned as, as a child i mean there's and i think what we're talking about is applicable to uh the church stuff i was mentioning yeah. with, with the fucking groomer is that they're in a position of authority and they mm -hmm. know you've opened up to them and then you've trusted them. And, and, and so there's that fucking power dynamic that to me is the most insidious. I mean, it's just so, and so you freeze up. So they're telling you it's okay for them to rub on you and to hold you and to touch you and to do all these things. Like the, when I say the amount, anybody who is evangelical can remember how much time you spent doing church stuff with church people in intimate quarters. We're talking four to five days a week sometimes. And especially with like discipleship and whatever weird names they put to things just to get more people on the walls mm -hmm. and to have more control over you. And so like the guy I'm talking about, I'm talking the amount of hours alone and vulnerable crying, telling sh this dude shit. I wouldn't tell anybody, you know, and it's, the whole time it was just more deposits at his fucking wank bank, you know, and it's, and, and it just, it's really atrocious that, that you, you, they can do that. I don't know. I, I fucking hate it. So then once you're out of it, you're like, I don't know how to function around people. Um, also, I just Cause wanna... those people were teaching you how to act. They were yeah. telling you how to react. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so insidious. I'm sorry, Helen. I talked. I, I was just going to say for anyone that's listening, either in live audience or listening to this later, we are talking about some difficult subjects. So yes. if you're having a hard time, do some self care. If you need to walk away, turn us off, take a break, come back. That's fine. Um, yeah. Do self care. You do not have to sit here if you're feeling uncomfortable emotions and feeling anxiety. So take care mm -hmm. of yourself because these topics are really difficult. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I appreciate that, Helen, because I was about to go into some more fun stuff. So uh, <laughs> I guess so after after i was like okay i don't have anybody i just started hanging out with my other friends my other friends were a lot older than me and they were bartenders and stuff like that so i i had this one i was drinking at this one bar at about 19 20 years old i had a, I, I had two 21st birthdays there you know so it, it was one of those things and but i was still i remember all my buddies would give me shit for being a virgin they all knew i was like you know what i've waited you know for 20 years i'm just gonna keep waiting but i was learning how to drink at that time and I would just get wasted. We used to go to this blues bar called Big Easy that we'd hang out. I'd be hanging out, just watching blues all night. And my buddy I, I played in metal and like hardcore metal bands with, he would feed me alcohol until I got sick. I'd go puke by the dumpster, sober up, come back in and drink more. I was miserable. I was just really going downhill real quick. So we had picked up this one band, uh, me, this dude named Shane. I had this minivan at the time that I was kind of at the point of living out of. I was about, I was getting to that point. And, uh, like, let's go pick up this band all out war from the, uh, from the airport. So we went and picked them up and it, I was already drinking on this big bottle of whiskey. So with Shane and, uh, we pick them up, we keep drinking. We go back to that bar I mentioned and some people met up, uh, one of the, one of those, one, because they're a bigger band in the our music genre in our scene. So of course everybody's partying. And, um, one of, there was a, uh, uh, one of my buddy's wives was there. And I'm not going to mention any names there, but um, as things progressed, we just kind of started getting a little more physical. Um, I was wasted out of my mind. I, I, could, I could barely see. And we get back to my buddy's apartment. And I remember, all I remember is I threw up on myself. And my poor, poor buddy, you had to clean it up. And then, so I'm like, all right, take off all my clothes. Found, I found a, a, a blanket somewhere and it's wrapped up in the middle of the floor. I'm going to bed. And then I come to and my buddy's wife is on top of me just going. I remember telling her, no, stop, no, no, no. And uh, yeah, so there you go. So that really fucked me up because that's like the one thing I had kind of been waiting on and it made me feel even more terrible, right? You know? So oh because, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so because of that, for like two years, I went, I, I made very bad choices and like just had partner after partner after partner. I wasn't using protection. I, I just, I was in a, I was in a path to self-destruction, 
You know, I, I was so depressed from that happening. I started doing a lot of drugs. I started selling drugs to, and to support more or less my habit. I could, so I could do drugs for free. And it was, uh, it got to me. I ended up living uh, after a few years, I was living at the trap house that I was selling drugs for. And, um, I was bad. I was bad off. And I, I'd, I'd eaten a bunch of psychedelics, like for a couple nights in a row, some guys came to the trap house. I was convinced they were going to kill me. Um, I don't know. I, of course they didn't, you know, but I was convinced they were, I was tripping balls and I had this fucking, this, uh, Mac 90 as Mac 90. I think I had a gun, a big gun with a silencer next to me. I'm like, I'm gonna kill these guys. Cause I'm not going to get killed. And I'm just, no one's going to care about these guys. I went and locked myself in the room with all the guns and just close the door and just try to make it through the night. Woke up in the kind of came to in the morning. I'm like, I got to get out of here, you know? And, um, uh, and that went on for, like from that point with that experience with that dude's wife up into that point went on for about four years. There was four years of heavy drug abuse, uh, working at bars, uh, joining two different street groups, um, selling drugs for one and just like being a maniac with the other getting jumped, getting attacked, having my head kicked in multiple times, um, hurting people pretty bad, people hurting me pretty bad. It just got to be really, really ridiculous. I ended up homeless, living in, a, living in the back of a warehouse out of my now broken down van, which eventually got towed, and I just lost everything. So um, I ended up sobering up for, I don't know, long enough to start, start doing some manual labor jobs. I was able to get those and got, got an apartment downtown and, um, just kind of started, started working my way up from there. And then, and, and then my, one of my buddies, cause I was always really violent. One of my buddies picked up MMA and he's like, Hey man, why, why don't you come down and do this thing? I'm like, all right, cool. Uh, because at that time I had told the street crew that I was running with what I thought about them, not to mention, couple of years prior, I was dating somebody that I guess everybody thought they had a right to, but apparently they were telling everybody that they did have. So, you know, somebody was doing some stuff behind my back. It was really gross. So because of that, I got targeted and you know, that's a whole head getting bounced off the concrete thing. And so I picked up MMA more or less like a Rocky montage thing. Like I'm, I'm drinking myself to sleep every night. Um, I'm getting targeted by a lot of people. I need, I need to do something. Or I, I mean, my life's going downhill. I have to do this. I'll get this or die. This is the point in the, the church testimonial where, where people find Jesus, but I yes. bet that's yeah. not where the story is going. No, no, no. I, th I found, I found MMA psychology and psychedelics. That's more or less what I found, you know, and it's, uh, so I'm, I'm not promoting them for anybody else, but that's kind of where, where I went down. And it's, uh, uh, with MMA, it, it gave me a community of people that I actually wanted to be like. And I'm like, oh, and maybe not them, because some of the, you know, everybody's a piece of, sh everybody can be a piece of shit, you know, whatever it happens, right? But I saw like a, a true discipline and a uh, something that I could actually put my time into that would increase how I felt about myself, right? So MMA and starting to do jujitsu and then eventually fighting in a cage gave me the self confidence to go back to school, because uh, so I went back to school, um, I. I went back, I, I got a degree in, I, I, I got a two-year degree in veterinary technology. I went and interned at the research center and I was going to start going for my LVT and doing animal research. I, I didn't like animal research things. So, uh, well, at least I didn't like, I wanted to be the principal investigator, but at that point I would have just been like the lead tech in the surgery suite. So instead I did overnight animal emergency surgery because I felt, I just felt like that was a better thing. It paid well. It was blood and guts and running, running radiography, running uh, uh, anesthesia, doing tons of blood work, uh, doing lab work, trach tubes. Uh, I was allowed to do parts of the surgery just because animal medicine is a little more liberal. And when you're state and nationally licensed, you're allowed to do other things as long as there's oversight by the veterinarian. Um, and then during that time, um, I was still training. And I went, I went, I'm like, you know, well, this is good, but I'm starting to hit kind of a pay block. So I'm like, what else can I do? I'm like, all right, I'm gonna learn how to weld. Okay. So I went to welding school and, but I'd already, this is like now my sixth year of college, but on, on my third kind of subject, you know, so went to welding school, uh, welded for a long time, opened a tattoo shop while welding. And cause I'd always grown up in tattoo shops and 
became a welding inspector and then closed down a tattoo shop and then worked my way up. During that time, I had gotten married and had a kid, like I mentioned. Our marriage was, was rough. We, had, we, just, we just had a lot of conflict internally. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but because of how difficult it was getting towards the end, uh, I had lost two businesses um, because I'd gotten screwed over by some insurance company. A bunch of people did. That was bad. And then one of, the ta- one of my two tattoo shops, I ended up suing my, my business partner. During that time, my mom took her own life. Um, it was inevitable, but it, it eventually happened. Um, so, and I blew my hip out fighting. So I was building a tattoo shop on crutches. My first hip surgery was botched. So I had to have two full, like they had to reshape my hip twice in eight months. Um, Damn, during, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It That's was some rough. serious fights you're, uh, you're participating yeah, yeah. in. Oh, yeah, like every sure. time I talk to him, like I always find out something new. Like I didn't, like we've talked a lot and I didn't know about you getting two hip replacements. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it was, it was rough. So they, uh, so we did the hip surgery thing. Um, during that time, I was working a lot and the, the marriage wasn't doing too well. Just a lot of differences and a lot of conflict. So let me see. Whenever fast forward to the COVID thing happening, I'm doing weld inspection. I finally got rid of the tattoo shops. A month before COVID, we had an oil crisis thing where Russia, blah, blah, blah. So oil prices uh, started screwing over what we were doing as far as welding goes because welding and oil and gas have a lot to do with each other. So that hit and then COVID hit. So then all transportation, everything got shut down. So I think it was in a matter of six weeks, I lost all work. It took almost two months for my unemployment to kick in. So I ended up digging holes and I was told to leave my house. So separated from the family and then went in like a, uh, I, I just, it was bad. So my mind started doing the disassociate, started disassociating again, kind of like it did whenever I was religious. And I'm like, mm. wait, so my mind's, why am I thinking these weird, f- oh, so then I'm like, I need to look into something, you know? So I started having the, the dreams again, started having night terrors again, started having sleep paralysis mm. again, started having hallucinations again. I started feeling really disassociative. Like my, this is one thing about being evangelical is you're, ta- you're taught that your internal dialogue is actually external that mm-hmm. you're receiving information mm-hmm. right you know yeah. so my mind started paying started thinking that it was that and i'm like no this is i've started realizing that I'm like this isn't good i'm so stressed mm-hmm. out and so miserable because at that point i've been sleeping in a separate room there, were, there was just stuff going on that wasn't good it just wasn't a happy household i've got my daughter and i just know it's about to end and i'm just fucking falling apart so i end up moving out And during that time, I'm like, I need to do something with my life because I'm falling apart. Um, I was in a child custody battle thing for a long time, had to do a, a, just, you know, a lot of stuff. I had ended up, I ended up finally getting it to where co-parenting 50, 50, nobody's paying child support. Everything's split down the middle. Everything is fair. And I'm getting paid back for what I put into my house. So, but that took years. The beginning of that Mm -hmm. wasn't good and it wasn't healthy. So I started looking in, I started watching Ted talks, uh, when I was still, before I'd moved out about psychology stuff, about mental health stuff. Uh, I started watching the ACA stuff, the ACD stuff, talking to people. And I'm like, you know what? Psychology is really interesting to me. This is something because I need to start diving into because I'm starting to see stuff. I started seeing a therapist. I started, I went to a, a psychiatrist. He ended up being fucking terrible. And my therapist, he actually ended up being pretty fucking terrible too. He said some real sexist and homophobic remarks and he was just trying to yes. bro down with me. And I'm like, no, no. Ooh. All, right, Ooh. All, right, all right, Ed, I got to. Yeah, because he had said something because I was like, you know, this divorce thing is difficult. He goes, well, man, uh, he goes, I got divorced. He goes, you just, you know how women are. I'm like, no, I really don't know how women are. But OK, let me hear this out. He's like, you know, he goes, think about how bad I had it. I got left for a woman. I go, OK. And he goes, yeah, think about it. Like, I got left as a band for a woman. I'm like. I don't understand how that's pertinent, but okay. And then <laughs> wow. I, stopped going, I stopped going to see him. It, it was really fucked up to me because around that time I was starting to admit to myself that I didn't just like females. So mm-hmm. I, don't, I didn't really feel safe talking to Ed about that. 
I'm, uh, I'm putting yes. a link in the chat to seculartherapy.org. Yes. Get you yeah. a therapist that has been vetted that is yeah. not going to say things like that. Wow. I... And you can interview your therapist before you accept therapy. You can ask them a series oh, yeah. of questions, find out, you know, their credentials, you know, their perspectives before you can commit to therapy. You can do this. Yes. <laughs> so you can interview your therapist because you're going to oh, give yeah. them money. So they better know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. Anna and I now she's she's my she's my fucking dog right now. I, I I like her. She's uh she knows the lingo. She is not very pro religion. Like she'll she you know she won't discourage a religious client, but luckily one we can talk a little bit more open about those things. And she so yeah she does a really good job with that. And and I've mentioned she's a trauma therapist, so she, she just knows what she's fucking doing. I like her a lot. Um, so I'd have to say in, in recognizing that, like my mind was wandering, I was getting a lot of intrusive thoughts. What I realized after I took some inventories was that whenever I'm under a lot, a lot, a lot of stress, I, I, I click pretty much every box for OCD and, mm -hmm. and I'm like, so, I mean, like, like almost everything to the T bam, bam. Like whenever I'm in unmanageable stressful situations. It's like, bam, yep, yep, of course. Yep, 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 everything. It's just ridiculous. And I started realizing that. And I'm like, okay, I need to start doing these things. I need to start doing, I, so I started down a pathway of health. But the way I tend to do well is if I, the way I learn about things is I need to learn how to do things. Like, I don't like learning about them. I want to fucking do it. So like with, I make tattoo machines as well. And I make handmade little one of a kind, nice tattoo machines. I got tired of fucking buying machines. I'm like, I know how to weld. And I know how to do this shit. I'm going to figure it out. So that way I don't have to buy machines anymore. I'm tired of doing that. I'm going to make it myself. And I figured out, all right, make some good fucking machines now. So I'm like, I, I could cage fight. I weld. I, I can figure my brain out. I can, I can get this fixed and I can figure some shit out. Well, so, and I love that you brought that up too. Like, you know, especially with like the, the MMA stuff and the martial arts. Um, I don't know if it was like this for you, but I remember growing up in the evangelical church and, you know, that martial arts was considered uh -huh. one of those things that's like, you know, oh, that's another religion. You need to stay yeah. away from that. That's evil. That's demonic. But I mean, you've kind of just described how actually, you know, it's it's a practice that that may actually be incredibly helpful in healing mm -hmm. if you're you know maybe you're going through trauma or maybe you know you're needing some kind of you know structure and and discipline i mean it's it's a great habit you know i'm not saying that's for everybody but no but we even have people the, the, the we have people that come to our gym just for conditioning but they mm -hmm. want to condition the way fighters condition they want they, these are people who come to the gym and hit the bags the same way we hit them and have the same footwork and do the same shit that we do in the same conditioning, but they're doing it to be healthy, but they want to, they want to know for a fact that what they're doing is legit and all of us win and we do well. So we're, they're, they're, they're doing a good job. They're, they're never going to get hit in the face once in their life, hopefully. But if it does happen and somebody goes after them, at least they'll be ready. Right. Mm -hmm. They're doing it to be healthy. And like, for me, for some people, just lifting weights is really exciting for them. I enjoy lifting weights, but I also like being really, I also I like being able to squeeze somebody's head off. I don't know. It, it's, it's not, it's in a legal, uh, mutually legal consenting setting. Yes. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I was going to say it's enthusiastic and, consent that you're looking for. Yes. Well, I mean, <laughs> we all, we all shake hands and fist bump before we go in <laughs> or, you know, in, in my, in my partner, in that case, we have specific safe words and blah, blah, blah. So mm. it's being, being somebody who's more sadistic. I enjoy giving pain but i have to learn how to comfort as well it is so, yeah. it is it is like the king yes. community <laughs> it is, no it really is yeah dude i mean there there is kind of a, a running joke within the jiu-jitsu community so it's uh yeah. and it's it's understood you know it's understood it's like we always joke with the guys it's like I mean, you just, it's cool, man. We just like to aggressively cuddle. It's right. It's aggressive. Oh, hugging. I love and that. I'm, I love aggressively cuddle. <laughs> it's aggressive cuddling. It. Well, because there's no, I love that. There's, there's no striking in jujitsu. <laughs> jujitsu, you're not allowed. You have some different types, but in, in jujitsu, it's all, it's all grabbing. There's no hitting. There's no kneeing. There's no kicking. There's none of that. There's just a lot of, a lot of grabbing, just a lot of man hugging, you know, in, in our case, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's good. You know, we, so everybody's really lighthearted about it. And whenever you allow yourself to be accountable to people and you're in that close of a quarter, I remember my judo coach years, we're talking 15, 16 years ago, Brian, uh, we, we were doing a private and first private with him and judo is throws takedowns and quick submissions. 
Whereas jujitsu, you mm -hmm. get them down. But of course, for anybody who doesn't know, it's a lot of ground wrestling and all of these different positions. It's a lot of fun. So Brian, we get the crash pad out, which is when you throw, you land on the pad. And Brian, he gets me and he pulls me really close. And he has his face on my face. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, what's he doing? What's he doing? And he goes, you okay with this? And I go, okay with what? He goes, being this close to me, I go, how else am I going to learn? Bo threw me. And I go, he goes, I just wanted to, I wanted to check with you, man. Is what he was saying. I wanted to check with you because a lot of dudes say they want to do privates, but then they're cheek to cheek with another dude and they get all weird and squirmy. I'm like, bro, I want, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put whatever on you, man. Just, just teach me how to throw somebody like you throw them. I'll do what touch, touch, whatever you want, bro. It's cool. Just, and, and but, but it's, so it's, it's kind of an understood thing, but if you're able to go past those barriers, I mean, not to mention with tattooing and piercing, I've, I've been naked and around naked and been trusted with naked so many times. It's just, it's, it feels comfortable to be that way. And it's a non, it's, it's really interesting. You can pierce somebody's nipple without looking at their nipple. It's just one of those things. And you, it's like this master, master art of doing it without like uh, looking at it you know you're I, I used to wax genitals you and, know what i'm talking about yeah you just do yeah. it you're not even it, there's no thing. sexual contact with, it's just a body part and you're just yeah. applying wax and peeling it off like you're not yeah. the context of certain things about the body we tend to sexualize them but in mm -hmm. a clinical like your gynecologist is, is not thinking about your vagina when no. he's doing like in a sexual way when he hopefully but a good portion of the time he's just like I'm like, I got to do a pap smear. <laughs> he's probably thinking about his taxes or dinner. Right, later. exactly. I mean, he's, he got his zone out. I remember being in surgery. If I'm thinking about the surgery or if I'm thinking about welding or you know, I play in a bunch yeah. of bands, if I, I'll be sitting there playing a show live and I'll be like, oh, where am I? I'm like, oh God, it's like driving home at the same time. Like the moment you start thinking about it, oh, fuck, where am I going? Where am I? Yeah. Am I, am I, I'm just, I shouldn't have smoked that. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things, right? Yeah, so, it becomes um, routine. Exactly. You know, so, 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 so I digress. So the psych, like I started going down the psychology route and I found RFR and I'm like, and I saw what y'all were doing. So I'm like, you know, I could be a call screener. I want to, I want to start giving back. I want to, I, I could help some people because I've done this religion thing. I'm going through therapy right now. And then actually Anthony called me and I got approved. But then during that time, I was also thinking about going back to school. And I, had, it was like within a month of me being approved. I'm like, you know what? I, I need to dedicate my time to school because I think going into debt to give back is actually a way for me to, so I couldn't devout, devote that time, but because of school and then kind of stumbling into the ACD, uh, Kelly over the ACD did what Helen has done with, with both of them with the ACA stuff. They're like, Hey, you need to do this. I'm like, what do I need to do? It's like, you need to do a show with this other individual about psychology and mental health stuff. I'm like, I do like, yeah, you need to do it. Okay, cool. I'll do it. And um, so we started Brain Matters. I started with one person and they, their life stuff just, you know, like with volunteer work sometimes takes precedent. It's hard. So they're like, well, you want to do it yourself? I go, oh, fuck yeah, I'm going to do this by myself. This is good. So for what? Helen, how long did I do it before my... For a while. I've been doing it for a while. I've been doing it for a while. God, like a, a long time now. At least... Oh. At least a year and a half. Have I? Has it been? Jesus. Yeah, been it's, been a, it's been a long time. Because... Yeah. And because we, we've been friends about that long. We've been yeah. a friend about two years. So yeah, I, yeah, I would say about yeah. a year and a half. I've been hitting the head a lot. I have no concept of time. It just kind of, <laughs> uh, listen, you know. I'm, whenever people ask me stuff, I'm like, at least a year and a half. I know that, but like time, it, time is just a construct people. Yeah, <laughs> especially when COVID you deleted your, a year anyway. Well, so exactly. Especially <laughs> when you get into your forties, time is a construct yes. <laughs> everything blurs together like 20 years ago to us is the 90s yes. <laughs> That's crazy. not, not, not yes. 2003 it's 1993 it's, yeah, it's still 1993 it's so, exactly. wild. Yeah. so so well, that really and what, what was really neat is that during that time with the acd stuff it's like any teaching it forces you to get better at it like teaching <laughs> make because okay these people are going to come and i'm going to do a lecture and I need to make sure to tell them the right shit because I don't want to give anybody some harmful shit. And I've been getting really challenged by my psychology classes. I got really like my, my favorite class I took so far was my feminine and gender studies. Uh, it was a social psychology and it made me realize how much of a sexist piece of shit I am. And, um, and it made me realize I had some bad fucking takes about things and I got mad about it. And I'm like, Are they really, They've yeah okay you're right. Okay. and i read this i'm like i'm not bob and i'd read i'm like yes yeah okay and then i i remember i remember telling my partner i'm like i'm, I'm all this that and i was like well you know this that and the other i'm like yeah you're right 
you know, so it's been a lot of that. And then with conversation with ACD and all that stuff has been really, really helpful. And actually getting a good therapist, all, all like the, because during that time, and especially like my partner being a therapist, you know, they don't therapize me, but they know how to do these types of things. I've, I've learned, especially in, let's say the past two years, the most important, some most, one of the most important lessons. And it's like how to start establishing boundaries with people. And, um, I've been, I, I was indoctrinated into thinking that I am, I have to do the male thing. I have to be the one that everybody's dependent upon. Um, I need to make more than everybody. I need to be stronger than everybody. I need to be the one that I need to be the knight in shining armor or whatever, you know, or, or, or the savior in denim. I, I don't know, whatever. And, and, and it's really, it makes me perfectionistic. And it makes me very like over overworking and over expecting in myself. And also at the same time, under expecting from other people and minimizing other people. And with the problem with being the savior and sometimes the martyr at the same time is that you have no boundaries because you're just waiting to prove yourself more and prove your value and prove your worth more and more. And especially with like some family dynamic stuff and with, like with, with, with fighting for my rights as a father and fighting for my rights as a homeowner and fighting for my rights in a divorce and fighting for my rights in other situations. I've, I've learned how to set boundaries and advocate for myself, um, which I'm also learning how to do because I just recently, I'm always, I'm once I, once I became an atheist, I'm like, fuck that shit. I've had no problem coming out as an atheist. I know a lot of, but, and that's, and that's being in Texas working oil and gas with very open, staunch Republicans, guys with Trump. I mean, these, the job sites I go to, these guys are ridiculous, but luckily and being an open atheist, these guys will come up to me like, Hey, Hey, Jason, man, I know you know about these things. I'm like, these things, well, what are these things? I know you, I know you know about that gay stuff. I go, all right, well, all right, Blake, tell me about the gay stuff. What, what are we about? About the about, gay bro? stuff. <laughs> well, no, but no, but it's cool because he comes up to me and he's like, man, so my daughter, you know, she's like 15. She's dating this older guy. He's 16. I go, yeah, what's the problem? He's too old for her. It's like, well, yeah, that's kind of, kind of a problem with that. I go, well, what's the problem? Well, he's trans. I go, what do you mean? Like, he identifies as male, was born, uh, they, they, uh, used to identify as female, is now identifies as male. He's like, yeah. And he goes, I don't know what to do. I go, what the fuck do you mean you don't know what to do? I go, treat that motherfucker like any other dude that you don't want around your daughter. I mean, how, <laughs> how else? I, and you got to translate to these guys. I go, you got a 16-year-old boy driving around. Your daughter's not even able to, she might have even been 14. And she's not able to drive. Do you want this dude around your daughter? What's the problem? I'm like, no, I don't know. It's like, well, if you don't fucking want him around, say, hey, motherfucker, stay away from my daughter. You know? And he's like, oh. I didn't think about that. I'm like, yeah, it's just another dude trying to get, get with your daughter, man. Treat him how you treat everybody else. And he's like, oh, okay, well, thanks, man. And, and so luckily being open and being very like people, because these guys, they're, 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 they have no qualms talking about religion, politics, and the trans agenda and all this shit. And so it's like, in a day, I'll have 10 things. And I'm like, God, which one do I pick today? You know, and generally it's, it's either the abortion one or the trans agenda or something about people just want to be depressed, you know, and those are the three things I just really, you know, and, but I've only recently uh, on secular, I, I got convinced of course, by Helen and Kelly. And, That's and what I do. <laughs> like, if you want me to influence on, you to do something, you, I will you influence on, you. <laughs> no, no. It, they're like, you need to go on secular sexuality. Go, yeah, I do. I need to do that. All right. All right. I'll do that. And I go, what do you want me to talk about? Like, I'm going to, and they sent me the, the questions. It's like, um, how do you feel about, about watching dudes have sex? I'm like, Oh, okay. I see what we're doing. Okay. So I, so I came out open. I'm like, Hey, my name's Jason. I like everybody, you know, and it's, uh, it was a really interesting experience because a lot of my friends are, you know, welders, oil rig, just you're, even if they are left leaning they're like, you would just never know it, you know? And these are just guys I'm around guys I grew up with. And I just, I haven't really told anybody I I've, I've left breadcrumbs, but that, that was the first time. And I thought I was really worried about, about the blowback, but one of my buddies who voted for Trump, who is, has some questionable morals and things like that. I hit him up. like, Hey, Ryan, you know, uh, 
Yeah, you, you saw that shit, huh? He goes, yeah, I saw that. I go, hey, we still cool? He goes, why wouldn't we be cool? I go, okay, cool, cool, man. I appreciate that, you know? And then I had one of my other buddies, super, super Republican. Uh, again, same thing. Hey, man, that was really, that was really awesome, man. Blah, blah, blah. We should go hunting soon, you know? And then, uh, and then uh, another one of my buddies, um, it just, I just, it's interesting. I had another one of my buddies. I kind of opened up to him about it. And uh, cause I was leaving breadcrumbs and uh, one of the dudes I played a band with, and I, this was before I went on the show, but I was kind of saying some things and making some jokes and leaving little breadcrumbs. Cause you know, after a while, I don't know if anybody's who's ever dealt with this, had it this way, but it's like, you start having dreams about shit. You start thinking about it. You start being like word vomit. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, and it just kind of comes out, you know, so that was happening and I just couldn't help it anymore. It's like, man, why don't you just fucking do it? I go do it. He goes, you know, what I'm fucking talking about. Uh, no, nah, man, I don't know what you're talking about. So then like I hit him up, I shot a message. I go, Hey man, I know what you're talking about, you know? And then it turned out that he has some of those feelings and may have had a crush on me in the past, but he doesn't act on it. And that was probably the first and only time he's ever talked about that. And it'll probably be the last time we have another, I have a couple bands I play in. We have another band text and this it's, I don't know. Did you, I don't know why this comes to mind, but you ever see that Thor movie with Jeff Goldblum and like it's that's like the like, best thor movie that's the best one okay. <laughs> so remember that, that 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 one lady she finds thor and it's like and goldblum's like i just want to say that you're a piece of trash he's like i was gonna say the best one we have i feel like you were just waiting to say that you know and, and, and so they sent a band text and we were talking about uh this is actually the pass out game. I saw you when I had a seizure. We were talking about that. One of my buddies like, man, I smoked too much weed and I got all weird and had an old man moment at a show. I'm like, have you had seizures? I've had a seizure. I haven't had, I had a seizure. And then my buddy, uh, one of my buddies in the band goes, he goes, oh, J Jason, how did that affect you? I go, it's kind of weird. I was kind of weird afterwards and had like a lot of nightmares and shit. It was real strange. And he goes, do you think that affected your sexual, sexual preference? I go, what, what do you mean? Like, getting choked <laughs> i don't know like yeah i like getting choked it's great nobody ever chokes me hard enough but it's i mean it, it's except it's, that one time except that one time yeah i don't remember and that was that one time it was perfect apparently i reacted well i guess and uh and i go i don't know what do you mean like me getting choked i go emily tries but she does a bad job and uh and then he's like well you know what i mean i go like like what do you mean? Like I got choked. Now I like Dick. I mean, I, I don't know. What, like, That's how it think, happens. I asked him, I go, do you think I had like a gay, a gay seizure, bro? Or, or what? Gay like shook, shook something gay loose. I mean, I don't, I don't know. He goes, do you identify as homosexual? I go, bro, we were just talking about white zombie and seizures. And now you're asking me, I'm like, no, I, I told him I identify as Freddie Mercury. He goes, what do you mean? I go, man, I want it all, bro. And, and it was just, he was, he was waiting. And then I gave him this like long kind of text thing. Of course, the other dudes in the band were like, whatever, I don't care. And, <laughs> and at the end, he's like, I go, I go, it's just sad that I, I, I go, it's sad that some dudes are <laughs> closeted, <laughs> you know? And um, he's like, yeah, closeted men are problematic worldwide. I go, yeah. And it just ended. I'm like, bro, you can, it's okay. You can, we can talk about these things, but it, it makes me sad because there's very few of us in our kind of group that have come out like who have presented as a straight dude, I guess, or were assumed to be a straight guy for a long time mm -hmm. and, and acted as such like I did. But it's, it's really sad because our, we do like, like my, a lot of our, a lot of the guys I grew up with are, are the, like they're the skinheads against racial prejudice. They're sharps or trads, non-racist skinheads that like to fight Nazis. So of course, during the BLM riots, all of my buddies would stand in between the protesters and the police as just a silent wall of supporters being like, we'll protect you. The police are protecting these assholes. So we're going to protect y'all. So those are the people I hang out with. We went fucking Matt Walsh, stupid ass came to university of Houston. Of course, all of my buddies came out and protested him, you know? So we, we do like rock for trans rights. We do things like that. Well, we, you know, in order to challenge people, we play the show dressed in drag. Fuck you. We do, you know, it's cool. So we, we have fun doing that, but no one's willing to come out yeah. and everybody still flirts with it. And everybody still plays grab ass and everybody does these things. And it, but, and then, Hey, Jason, Hey, Jason. Hey, I'm like, yeah, bro. It's cool. You can like, I know, I know you want to touch it every once in a while. Not mine. Somebody else's for sure. Or they'll be like, man, I just, you know, I really like, like, uh, like, like T girl porn. I'm like, yeah, dude, I, you, you like it all too, man. It's so, no, no, I just, it's you know, I just, like, that. I just like that. I just, <laughs> I just like, dude, I, yeah. 
I was well, there too, you know, it's cool. I was, I, I only wanted to kiss him because I was stoned. I mean, I don't know, you know, I mean, whatever. All these excuses, yeah. Always. I love that you're you're out there and I mean, you're, you're one of our, I don't want to say you're one of our coolest guests because all of our guests are really cool, but you have this like kind of cool vibe about you, right? Shut like, up, you, dude, you know, you play up. in a rock band, you do MMA, you've got face tattoos, you know, and at the same time, you're out there like normalizing, mm -hmm. hey, it's cool to be queer. Hey, yeah. toxic masculinity is not where it's at. And no. I, it's not what people expect probably when they first meet you. And, and I feel like that does so much good, you know, for people to see that. I mean, I, I think that's, that's incredible. I just, I, I love it. And I could listen to you talk for literal hours. This is amazing. Um, we Thank do you. have to start thinking about going to Q and A at this point, so we can get to the hangout. But yeah. is there anything that you want to leave us with, as far as uh, any final uh, advice, recommendations, uh, resources? Well, I mean, if uh, sorry, it's just a, got an air bubble. Sorry, it's real <laughs> gross. Um, I think if anything, if you're able to be as transparent as you can be and whatever it's just, it becomes addicting after a while. Mm -hmm. Like for me, what I could leave anybody with this is I had to figure out which discomfort I was willing to sit with, you know, for me, maybe I had, I say, maybe I worked towards being able, like I finally felt safe enough to come out as queer when I started training for bare knuckle boxing fights. For me, it's because I'm just, I'm, I'm just nervous about people. You know, I live in a hard mm -hmm. city. Um, I had an altercation with somebody the other day who was trying to get into my truck and it was, it was just so weird, you know, first time I've ever pulled a gun on anybody in my entire life. It was really scary situation. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, I've just, I, and it's living in a scary environment. Houston's one of the top murder capitals and it's insane living, growing up in a very violent scene in a very violent state that at my job site drops F bombs and T bombs and N A B C all the bombs drops them all. It's, it was really, and at my work, open Trump supporters making F bomb jokes, all the jokes, right? All the jokes, you know, I make good money. So for me to come out was very scary. I'll, I can be the, the token atheist. So I'll ask you, Jason, he just, he's a science guy, you know, whatever. You know, he's just one of us, bro. He drinks beer like everybody else, you know? So they think, right? But it's, I, I realize it's like, okay, I can protect myself. Um, I, I have the means to come out and I, I have enough hustles that if somebody wants to fuck me over, I'll do okay. But I just couldn't sit with the discomfort of not being my genuine self. Um, the reason I, I mentioned, I feel like a bodyguard is because I feel like being a six foot tall, 200 pound, trained fighter, um, I can get in between people, right? You know, cause not everybody's six foot tall, 200 pounds and likes to punch shit for fun, right? Other people are pacifists, don't like guns, you know, don't like, I, I'm just the meathead that does, right? But it's also important for me, I see my friends and it makes, I'm getting, it makes me sad because I see my friend, my, one of my best friends, she came out and uh, started visually, uh, visibly transitioning three years ago shot at multiple times, Ugh. death threats from our gym. You know, I'm the only person who called them and told them the fuck you, dude, you're acting like Westboro Baptist church. Uh, the one provider, I just, I just, I just like, you know what? She's fucking brave. This, this, this one dude who's five, four and weighs 120 is just wearing pride flag shirts and shit. Fuck me. I, I was just ashamed of myself. I really was. And it's no shame to anybody, but for me, it's just like, it's, you know what? I just, I feel like I'm just letting down myself and the people around me. And I should just open my fucking mouth because it's only one life. So hey, Cara. Yes. I was thinking before we move to Q&A, we, sh we should share the poll results. Oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, brain. let's do that. Yes. <laughs> Helen is the brains of the operation this uh -huh. evening. I just got off a plane earlier. So thank you. Oh, goodness. You're putting <laughs> way too much responsibility on me right now. <laughs> well, I am going to share the results and I will read those. Yeah. And then we'll go to Q&A after that mm -hmm. and yeah. like stick around, Jason. Um, we're, yeah. we, we have questions for you. Um, for sure. If you can. I don't want to yeah, take of up. Of course, no, I'm good. But, I'm good. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's real quickly, let me, let me share the results. So yeah, we did have some interesting answers to the poll questions. Um, 
uh, when we asked, um, have you ever been shunned or kicked out of your religious community? 28% of people said yes, and it was mutual. 7% of people said yes, that happened to them, and they did not want to leave the group at the time. 56% said no, and 9% had never been in a religious community. Um, when asked how it affected them, 12% said it was awful, still upset about it. 12% not ideal, but got through it. Uh, five percent said said no big deal. Nine percent said it was the best thing that ever happened to them. So kind of a kind of an almost even split on that. But you know, for the people who did answer yes, it, it sounds like it it was pretty rough. They could really identify with with some of the story that you shared with us today. So I think that that was really impactful that you were able to share that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, we really appreciate that. That's something we were talking about before the show that you know we should probably discuss more uh, because this is something that happens to people. Um, okay, I'll just read the other answers to the questions real quick. Um, if you left a religious belief system, did you become more comfortable with your sexuality, gender identity, or gender presentation afterwards? And 44% of people said yes. Wow. That is a huge... That's um, a good number. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that programming is strong. <laughs> and uh, let's see, 5% said no, 9% not sure, and 42% not applicable. Um, so it sounds like the, the yeses have it on that one. Um, it's the phase. It's a very strong phase. It's a phase that might last <laughs> very, your very entire strong. life. Yes. <laughs> um, and then finally, after leaving religion, did you ever get back into religion again? 2% said yes, they went back to the same one. 14% went back to a different one or went to a different one. 21% said no, but considered it. 44% of people said no way, not going yeah. back. Uh, and then 19% not applicable. So. You know, I think it's interesting if you combine the yes, yes, and no, but I considered it, you still had, what, 30, was that? Uh, yeah. 37% mm -hmm. yeah, with, with mm -hmm. a latent religious inkling. And that's really interesting mm -hmm. that even afterwards, it still has its, its claws in you. That's almost mm -hmm. as many as those who said no fucking way. As that's, pretty, that's pretty interesting how it was almost divided down the center. That wouldn't be much of a, of a deviation, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. not at all. Yeah, those are really interesting results. Um, okay, well, I'm going to stop sharing those and we will actually go to our exit poll here in a little bit. But first, we have a couple of questions for you and we'll go through this part real quick so we can wrap up and go to the hangout. Mm -hmm. um, but let's see the first question. Oh, this is an easy one. Um, someone was wondering if you could mention again, you talked earlier about a peer to peer uh, support. Mm -hmm. uh, program that you've been working in. Can you mention what that is again and where people can find it? Oh, for sure. So uh, Helen and I uh, both also work with the Atheist Community of Discord. Uh, I also, we, and we both work with the ACA. So one of my things that I do is every Tuesday uh, on 8.30 Central Standard Time, um, uh, we do a thing called Brain Matters. And it is a peer-to-peer -peer support group that I direct and my co-pilot is my buddy named John. And every once in a while, we have some guest speakers like Helen came in. Or I'll interview, uh, or I'll interview some people about, you know, who are just awesome people, and I, I want to hear what they have to say. Um, what we, the way it's generally set up is there's going to be a topic that I'll ramble about for, let's say, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and a lot of times, my partner, who is a licensed uh, clinical therapist, uh, Emily, uh, they'll be there uh, probably 75 to 8% of the time. Uh, just just listening and overseeing and kind of feeling out what's going on. And one of us will talk uh, for about 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes 30 minutes, you know, but generally 45 to an hour, kind of like this. And then we go into group discussion and that can last all the way from an hour into evangelical times, like three or four hours, you know, just depending on the nature. And there is a trigger warning every time. Uh, tomorrow, since uh, I've been in class, I, I'm finishing my last semester before I start going towards my master's. It's going to be, no, thank you. And I'm so excited. Congrats. And, uh, no, thank you. I want Big my brain. PhD eventually. <laughs> yes. And, uh, I do want my PhD real bad, but uh, it, it's a total wet dream for me. But um, it, tomorrow, uh, John's going to be running it. And it's going to be a discussion about coming out of the closet. We had had a discussion about this before. But it's going to be people who tend to have multiple multiple things that are closeted, i.e. with our community a lot of times it is lack of belief and a sexual preference or gender identity uh, or presentation that generally people are keeping behind. And John's going to talk about his, because John is openly gay, married uh, to Brian, who's he's, he's great. And um, 
he, for him, it's a lot easier for him to discuss his, uh, his sexuality than it is his uh, lack of belief. So this is something he's been a lot more open about been considering doing some work with the ACA and he's going to, he's been discussing that and we're all very open with each other. Um, there's always a lot of hard topics, a lot of stuff that I discussed in here, I've gone into depth with and, uh, people share some hard things. Um, so again, eight thirty central standard time, it's going to be on the atheist community discord. Uh, it's called brain matters every Tuesday and just feel free to, you don't have to interact. You know, it's not like fight club. You don't have to fight the first night, just come in and listen. Sometimes people just want to come in there and listen because it's nice to know that like other people can be just as miserable or just as happy or struggling with the same things or be just as confused or just as worried when we, we, we go through a lot of things. Uh, if I ever go into a lecture about anything involving psychology, I always post my resources. I'll post pages and pages and pages. So y'all can just have them. This is shit that I have to, <laughs> I'm in debt for, but I like to be able to give it back. And it's, uh, I, I'm representing the ACA on it. Um, I'll be on nonprofits here. I think next week, because Helen, you're doing this week, right? Yeah, I'm, I, think, I, yeah. I'm recording on Wednesday. <laughs> I think I'll be next Wednesday and then possibly another one. And we're talking about doing some more shows on the ACA. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also the official ACA intern right now. So if y'all want to get in touch with the ACA, uh, we have some stuff we're trying to do. We always need more volunteers. We need more production staff. We just, we just need help. Volunteer works hard. It takes a lot of time. So, yeah. And we definitely appreciate you coming on here Thank too. <laughs> I know this is an, an extra, extra bit of volunteering, uh, too, but, but this is great. I, I am so pleased that we were able to get you and this has just been a fantastic story. It's, it reads like a testimony, but it's, it's got a happier yeah. ending, I think. <laughs> and, uh, before we moved to the hangout, uh, Helen, do we have one more question? Yeah. Um, get it real so, quickly. Yes. So, um, you have some psychological training, so, um, I'm mm -hmm. gonna, what are some common, but easily missed signs that someone is suffering from religious trauma? What have you, um, based on your own experience and what you've studied? <laughs> I mean, it's, God, I, I like this. I think what's interesting, because being in trauma therapy, one thing you have to look at is your belief system. Trauma tends to breed stuck points. So you, you have these, these beliefs, let's say, because uh, I, I broke down stuck points the other day. So I appreciate you asking this. Sorry. <laughs> so let's say I have this belief, all religion is evil. Okay. Well, we go down a list. It's like, okay. And well, what are what what uh, what emotions do I feel about this? Let's say anger, hundred percent, disappointment, hundred percent, and then we go down. Okay, well, what what is the evidence for all religion being evil? Well, I'll give you know like you would anything. This right here, this right here, the the Catholic Inquisition, or let's say uh, you know the the cover ups and shuffling priests and things like that. Let's say it's something like that. Okay, that's good. Well, what's the evidence against it? What do you mean? well, what's the evidence against all religion being evil? Shit, I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. Well, hold on, let me think. Well, I know some Wiccan stuff that teaches like being earth conscious, that's pro-science, mm -hmm. pro-humanism. Um, I know some pagan polytheists that are, that are that. I know some deist people who are just like, well, I think this happened, but I'm not going to attribute anything to it. That's kind of neutral. It's not terrible. I mean, we could debate it could be an epistemological issue, but when it comes to morals and values, these are, I know people who are probably more earth conscious and humanistic and moral than I am. Okay. Well, holy shit. Maybe there's some, you know, and then, so what you do is you just kind of go down your belief systems and, and you start to deconstruct it. What is, is there all or nothing thinking? <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, it is all or not. I said all, well, is, are you minimizing it? Are you overgeneralizing? Yes, I am. Okay, so then after you do like a personal inventory of that belief, you go, it's like, well, now all these things considered, how would you restate it? And let's say, well, I could restate it being like, uh, of the religions, I see the monotheistic ones that are patriarchal are really damaging to this, this, and this, you know? And then, or I could say, it's like, I could even say something positive. Some of the, some of the Satanists and paganists or pagans and, some of the people who are into witchcraft and polytheism there, or even some sects of Buddhism teach very positive things. 
that are actually if some of them like we've seen with like mindfulness meditation is extremely useful in the right circumstances uh, and with proper therapy, but it's actually something that was developed by a specific group that has actually been shown to be very, very positive for a lot of people and not everybody again, overgeneralization, but for a lot of people. Okay. Well, that's, you know, and then what do I give that? I'm like, well, I believe that that's actually really good. So then you go back to the original thought and you're like, well, now think about everything. How do you feel about that original thought that all religion is, is immoral? Then I'm like, well, you know, take away, you know, the monotheistic ones and then Hinduism for the caste system and some other weird shit that doesn't let you like use medicine. That's at about 60%. Yeah. About 60% of those guys are real, real fuckers, you know, but then you got the other 40% who are just, you know, either doing something moral or maybe have some latent hangups or, you know, indoctrination. We know early on in developmental stage actually rewires your brain. So maybe they just have some issues from that, your brain rewiring. And so actually these are moral people. They're not immoral. They're generally doing a cafeteria pick, picking all the good stuff out of these religions, even some atheo Christians, or uh, you have uh, my family's, half my family's Jewish. And so you have just people who are culturally Jewish and they believe in humanistic values. So in doing that, and you realize that a lot of these stuck points are trauma related. Some of mine were the world is out to get me, you know, there you go. Overgeneralizing what are what, you know, there's definitely a lot for that, but there's a lot of cases, a lot of evidence against that like this right here, friends like Helen, new friends like Kara, you know, just the ACD people, you know, it's, it's really, it's really great. So then there's evidence against that. So I can go through all my stuck points and I, and, and I have a list of them in my journal and I go down any trauma related stuck point and kind of judge it skeptically. And I think the thing about skepticism is that we're really good, or we've become really good at skeptically evaluating everybody else and everything else. Mm -hmm. But if you've been traumatized by religion or anything in kind of religion adjacent, whether it's involving sexuality, gender, gender identity, gender expression, or, or the mixture of everything, or even just different <laughs> cultural, let's say you really enjoy doing witchcraft stuff. Let's say you are an atheo pagan. Let's say you really enjoy doing some polytheistic stuff, but you feel condemned because of your Catholic upbringing, you know, that's investigate that, you know, it, it could even be non-religious. It could be like, uh, I'm not allowed to make mistakes. Right. And well, why aren't you allowed to make mistakes? What is evidence for that? If I make a mistake, everything's going to fall apart. Well, that's a all or nothing. You're using big language. You're generalizing. Generally, the reason you think you're going to make a mistake is because of this narrative you're telling yourself about a traumatic event that you could have, would have, should have, only if you're still bargaining, you're still grieving it. You haven't even, you haven't even worked through the whole thing. You're still blaming yourself. Um, and what's really interesting is that in doing that, I now feel empowered because I have to admit to myself that I have a role to play. Sure, mm -hmm. I was victimized. Mm -hmm. Sure, I got, I got fucked over. Sure, it took me a long time to really figure out life. I'm still, I mean, I'm not figured out, but to actually get my feet up underneath me. But like, okay, yeah, people victimize me. Fuck them, cool. But there's still me. There's still me. What am I going to do with this? What can I do with this? And what should I expect out of myself, if anything? And it's just being honest with yourself. I think during anything involving religion that's traumatized you, it's, it's looking out for something like a foreclosed identity to where, do I actually believe this? Here's something I feel strongly about, but have I myself considered this using my values, you know, and using logic and reason, not my logic or my using logic and reason. Like, can I prove this to myself again, if I were to start over? Mm -hmm. So I think identity for foreclosure is a huge thing to look at because if you have an emotional feeling about gravity, like the force of gravity, that's something to really consider. So when you start having emotional feelings about facts outside of like Greg Abbott my, and the stupid fucking Texas legislature just all needs to go like play in a freeway somewhere. Yeah, that's okay. I can have emotions about that because they're legislating against my rights. That said, very basic facts like I have no reason to believe in a God. And so oh, it's like, why are you so emotional about that? 
That's mm-hmm. like, that's, and it's, it's, I'm not, I'm not attacking it. And apparently I'm attacking your identity. That is something that's so intrinsically into your identity. So if you're emotional about something, you need to really think about why am I emotional about this? Is it rational for me to be emotional about this? Cause emotions can be very reasonable and rational things. Somebody is legislating against queer people. Yes. I'm going to get mad about this. Somebody says God doesn't exist. Ah, why are you mad about that? Like, mm. why, why, why are you mad about that? What does that do? What does that challenge in you? Maybe I'm, maybe you should be mad about it. Show me why you should be mad about it. Prove to yourself why you should be mad about that. You know, I love that perspective that you have yeah. where you're, it's, it's like, you're not suppressing these emotions. You're, you're actually, you're digging deeper into them and, and yeah. wondering, you know, let me ask this question to myself. <laughs> you don't have to argue with other people. You can, you can actually examine your own beliefs and do your, your critical thinking by, by looking at yourself first. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, I think we've talked on here before about, you know, getting excited to find out you're wrong because yeah. <laughs> now yeah. I know more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, like I learning love new that. Shit. Yeah, learning exactly. I, always say, I always say feelings are going to feel. It's so what do you do with the feelings? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, feel. yeah. But feelings are going to feel. Your feelings are valid. It's just a matter of what you're going to do once you're having those feelings. <laughs> yeah. And th- this has been just such an incredible story. Again, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us, Jason. Like, you're definitely going to have to come back because we are not done with this conversation with you. Yeah. <laughs> but you're coming thank back, you so Jason. Much. Yeah, you're coming okay. back. You're coming back. I said so. <laughs> yeah. right. Helen has fallen well told you. I, yes. I fallen told you. So you have to yes. come back. <laughs> and, uh, and we are going to move to the hangout here in just a second. So stick around if you can and if you have more questions. Uh, but real quick before we move to the hangout, Helen, do you you want to tell us what we'll be doing here next week? Yes. So uh, for our veterans, um, our wonderful resident volunteer, Diva Teacher, will be back again doing another talk on love and relationships. So what does love got to do with it as Tina Turner famously asked? Yes. And what is fantastic about emotion? What troubadours do modern do to modern musicians and rom-coms miss to personal declarations of love and its manifestation is almost as synonymous with humanity as the capacity for reason perhaps what that why they're so often pitted against one another so let's explore love both as a feeling and as an emotion both of yeah <laughs> Most of the feeling and emotion, a few expressions of it, including monogamy, polyamory, and relationship anarchy, and find a few personals to help us on our own tunnels of love. Okay, I hope he's not mad at me that I did not do that as well as I want to represent David. So if he scolds me, I deserve it. <laughs> okay. He'll be here next week to talk more about it. So that's, that's just right. the teaser trailer. That's right. This is the foreplay people. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so if you can't get enough of RFRX, please go, as I said, go check out our previous recordings on our YouTube. There's 102 of them for you to view right now. Or if you can't get enough, you want more go to your spotify your speaker your apple wherever you get your podcast and you can find us on there there are more episodes there as well as i said if you have questions inquiries comments creative hate mail please send it to um rfrx at recovering from religion.org or, or suggestions for hosts we will take those as well um you can find us on our um blog um, where you can um, hear other people's personal stories, get more resources and all that jazzy stuff. And you can find previous recordings of our podcast on recoveringfromreligion.org dash podcast. You can hear those as well. Kara, tell people how to find us on the socials. <laughs> yes, I would love to do that. We are on all the socials or many of them anyway. They seem to come out with new ones all the time, but we are on Facebook. We have a Facebook support group page as well. We are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, we are on TikTok. I'm dropping all those links in here now. So whichever one of those or ones of those that you use, 
go ahead and give us a follow or a subscribe or a like or a share or whatever it is that that platform does. That really helps us get out there to reach more people and help other people find us and see what's going on at RFR. And so it's also fun to keep track of what's going on and you get to be 20% cooler on the interwebs. So that's, that's another benefit. Yeah. And thank you all so much for coming this evening. Before we move to the Hangout, I am going to launch our poll at the end just to see how you enjoyed the program. And this helps us out to make sure we're producing shows that people are interested in hearing about and lets us know how we're doing. So I'll read the questions to that real quickly. And then Helen is going to wrap us up and we'll go to the Hangout. So as a personal thank you to my wonderful J my wonderful friend Jason, thank you for doing the talk tonight. And I twisted your arm to do it because that's what I do. Oh, thank um, you for this was, me. yeah, really this was really, you. yeah, I knew you would have interesting stories, talk about your deconversion process, you know, um, all the things that you've been through and where you are now. Um, being so open and honest is something that I really appreciate about you. And that's why I love you. So, you know, I'm really glad that you were here tonight and we're going to have you back as a rule because I said so. <laughs> so, yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. We'll so, <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you, sweetheart. I want to remind everybody that everything that you get as a benefit through recovering from religion, which when it comes to our website, resources, doing these talks, um, seeing our ambassadors out in the wild, everything that we do is all done through donation. So we can keep bringing you all the wonderful content that you get to experience as part of the RFR community. And with that, I am going to say good night.